I've been playing the oboe and repairing oboes for about 38 years now. And this is uh, volume two of my oboe repair uh, videos. This time we're going to get to more of the meaty stuff, uh, eventually to pad replacement. And uh, in order to do that, uh, we're going to also look at fitting keys and, and uh, surfaces of tone holes, make sure they're in good shape. Uh, straightening bent keys, uh, we'll throw in some spring replacement too. We'll talk about different types of pads, cork pads, skin pads, uh, the synthetic pads, and different methods of putting them in. If you missed volume one and want to get that, uh, we did a thorough discussion of uh, adjusting uh, on both oboe and English horn, uh, testing, uh, play testing an instrument that you've repaired, uh, the suction test, and the way to do that, oiling the keys and the wood, uh, removing octave vents, even stuck octave vents, and uh, cleaning out the octave vent area and resealing that, disassembling and reassembling an oboe, various ways of removing stuck swabs, replacing tenon and key corks and the glues that I use for that and how to pack an oval properly for shipment. Now we're going to talk about ways of installing pads and, and uh, different methods and different types of pads. You'll need some sort of glues. Uh, traditionally shellac was used. This is stick shellac. Shellac is uh, the spittle of a lac beetle uh, over in Asia. They build their nests with it. And uh, it's somewhat refined. The lighter color ones are refined more and generally more expensive. Uh, you've got the uh, French stick shellac is kind of a cream colored. This is uh, called George's glue. I believe this is a combination, a mixture of uh, the, the French stick shellac and, and uh, a hot melt glue, a plastic type glue. And it works real well. It, it holds its shape a little better. It doesn't run as quickly when, when the heat's applied to it as the shellacs do. Uh, this is a uh, liquid shellac. It's mixed with uh, denatured alcohol to make it uh, liquid and uh, it takes longer to dry or you can heat the key till the all the uh, 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 alcohol burns out of it, bubbles out of it. Nowadays a lot of the student line instruments and even some of the b better professional repairmen are using uh, glue sticks like from a hot glue gun. There are a couple different uh, melting temperatures. I would get the high melt type uh, in case some uh, careless kid leaves an instrument in the car trunk in the summer or something. Less chance of the pads uh, moving around, shifting. Uh, this one comes from uh, Jeff Smith, JL Smith Company uh, in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. And that's what I use for most of my work. Sometimes the George's glue is, is real handy when floating in the aperture pads with the little holes in the middle. I also call them the donut pads. Uh, because it tends not to, uh, to ooze out so bad uh, through, through the hole in the middle and out the sides of the pad. Besides glue uh, of various sorts, you're going to need some sort of a heat source to melt the glue. This is an acetylene torch. Uh, this is called the Smith's Torch Kit. It comes with a regulator uh, to regulate the amount of atmospheric air a mixture to the uh, acetylene gas. And it comes with, uh, di you can buy different size tips for it. This is a little jeweler's tip. This is called a striker. It's got a kind of a rough metal uh, uh, barrel in there that uh, flint strikes against and it makes a, makes a spark like that. And you turn, turn it on and you have a, a fine flame, a kind of a pencil tip flame for uh, heating up keys to melt the glue. I've got different uh, size tips here so you can do silver soldering or soft soldering or whatever you, else you would need to do. Now we're going to show you the tank and show you what that looks like. This is the acetylene B tank is the size of it. They have a smaller one called a C tank, which I, I've seen. They're, they're kind of rare though. But this is the usual tank that you will see in uh, most repair shops. Uh, you can regulate the uh, air mixture, the atmospheric air mixture. Uh, and this is all I use for most of my pad work. It's very convenient. Uh, uh, you don't really need an oxygen tank, the MAP gas, or anything like that. Uh, oxygen's one of the most uh, dangerous gases there are, actually, as far as 
possibly uh, tipping over and, and uh, exploding or something like that. Uh, but this is, this is a fairly safe gas to use. And this is the most common one you'll see in most uh, band instrument repair shops, the backs of music stores, that sort of thing. This is a little torch that I got from Faree's Tools. It says on it, Master Appliance. MT11 is the model number. You might look that up online and see if you can find something like that. Uh, this is real handy. Uh, it's got a pencil tip flame that's a real good size for, for most woodwind work. You could probably even do soft soldering, but not, not silver soldering with that. It's a little bit awkward because it's a two-handed operation. But I've used and tried all sorts of little uh, blazer torches and all the little mini torches, and, and this is the only one I've been comfortable with. There may be others, but this is the one I've found that, that's quite handy if you don't have the uh, larger acetylene tank uh, and don't want to have that in your home or, or at your business uh, for safety reasons. This, this should probably be a little bit safer. This one's the Votaw Pad Cup Heater. Uh, this is available from Votaw Tools or, or from uh, Allied Supply. Uh, it's a little electrode thing. You turn it on and uh, you've got these two carbide tips on this handle. And when they touch metal, like this, usually on the key arm, you, can, you might have seen a little smoke on that little spark there. That'll heat that up and the glue will uh, softening you can pick out a pad see that that just fell right out of there uh, it'll heat up the glue that way when it when it touches metal this is useful on all woodwinds uh, it doesn't work on uh, lacquered brass uh, saxophone keys it has to actually be touching the metal uh, this is real handy it runs about 200 or two and a quarter these are also available at uh, Micromark which is a hobby supply place and uh, so that's been in real handy when I've had to do some traveling and, and clinics on repair. It might be useful in a college dorm, uh, dormitory or in, in, a, in an apartment where you wouldn't want the uh, gas flame. This is just a regular soldering gun. This is known as the split tip soldering gun uh, technique of heating key cups. Um, these are available at Home Depot, Lowe's, just about anywhere for uh, in the neighborhood of $40. What you do is, is they come with different soldering tips here, and you, you uh, split it. You, you saw it uh, so it's no longer connected there. And then you can put it around the key like that. You can bend it to different shapes to fit different size keys and configurations. And then when you uh, get it connected to the key and you pull the trigger, then it'll heat up the key cup and, and melt the glue. The two hardest pads on the oboe are these large aperture pads down here, the middle finger and ring finger of the right hand, especially if it has the split mechanism down here on the ring finger. I'm going to show you what, what I call the E-pad, the middle finger pad. That's kind of a tricky one. This time I'm going to my acetylene torch, which I'm used to. That half hole pad didn't go so well because I was doing things in a manner that I'm not as familiar with. So I'm going to take out this old pad and remove the, the old, uh, looks like French stick shellac in there, the kind of cream colored shellac. That key has a small hole in it that has to vent for the high C sharp and D uh, particularly the high C sharp to be in tune. Uh, that may or may not be open depending on your high D fingering, what you use to get that in tune. I'm going to choose a pad that fits well. There, that just goes in, just a tiny bit snug. stone here. That's my flat surface since I lost my piece of plate glass that's around here somewhere. I'm going to choose the best side of the cork pad to go against the tone hole. I'm 
going to do a combination of floating and sanding on this pad. Maybe your eyesight's better than me and you won't need the magnification to see that. But I've got that pad pretty good. This key doesn't have the little what I call chimney inside to hold it, to retain the glue. So I'm going to cut the hole in, in this e-pad. I always do it this way. I'm going to cut that hole after I float the pad in so the glue can't ooze out onto the face of that pad. I need to fit that just slightly with the emery board. I want it just loose enough in there that I can kind of move it around, float it around on the layer of glue so it doesn't stick in the key. And the cork will actually heat up a little bit from the, uh, from the hot glue and expand a bit and be a little snugger in the key than, than you thought. So you got to bear that in mind. Okay, I got a nice fit there. And this time I've got my uh, glue stick. I'm going to heat the tip of this. And put some on the back of the pad. Make sure I've got the right side. I need a good enough layer of glue that I can float it around in the key, but not so much that it's going to ooze all over the place. Just lightly press it in there. And this is the way I usually install pads. Wipe off the rod kind of sticky and apply some oil to the end of the rod I prefer to do this uh, especially in these trickier areas like, like this I, I like to get all this other stuff out of the way it's really hard to get these keys lined up with their springs and all. Okay, I found one of my spring hooks and got that key working. I want it to open high enough that I can reach around there. And having all these keys off the front too helps me to reach there with a the pad slick. I'm going to feel with the paper to see that that's not hitting very well at the front. It is hitting considerably at the back. With this fine torch, if you point the, the flame kind of tangentially across the key uh, and don't point it down at the wood, you can get in there like this and not damage the wood at all. Just lightly press it down. I know it needs to be tipped forward, so I put the pad slick under there. You got to be careful touching the hot key. That's a little closer. It'll take a few times, generally. Every once in a while you get lucky and it just goes just right. You can see the glue may be oozing out there, out that top hole in the key. And that's why I don't want that hole in the pad yet. It would be all over the face of that pad. But I do like to see a little bit of that. That tells me that uh, I don't have any glue voids in there, especially these aperture pads. If you got a void in the glue underneath, the, the air can come up through the hole in the pad and out the side of the pad, even if it hits the tone hole well. So you should check it all around in several spots. It's a lot better than it was. It may take you easily half a dozen tries to get it right. Try not to burn the edge of the pad. You need a clean rag handy to wipe any glue that might show up 
out of that hole or along the sides of the pad. I guess I got each, each key is a little different. You got to look at the inside shape of the key and see how much room you have for glue. That's pretty close now. It's still ever so slightly light at the front. Which brings me to a point. The key's hinged at the back and comes down like this. So a thicker pad's going to hit first before it's level to the tone hole. A thinner pad's going to go down further and might hit the tone hole at the front first. So the thickness of the pad and the amount of glue you have underneath it can be very critical to whether you can get a good seal. So you need a good assortment of thicknesses and sizes of pads to do good pad work. Now I floated that pretty well. Now I'm going to show you how to check that uh, with a pencil test. We're going to use a piece of cigarette paper and scribble a bunch of pencil on it. And put that under that pad pull it just a little bit and when you take the key off and turn the key over it's just like a dentist uh, using carbon paper to see where your teeth are hitting where your uh, filling needs to be ground down a bit I don't know how well you can see that that's a pretty even seat all around there it's just a little bit light at the front I've got this brass stick, you could uh, any kind of a metal stick, a ruler or whatever. It's got two different grits of sandpaper on it. You can sand down the areas where the pencil's hitting first. You can be all the way on the pad like that and just try to try to put a little more pressure on the on the side that's hitting first, or you can get just get the little areas. With the corner, you can reach across and, and angle this up to reach the back of the pad only wherever you need to sand and you can use the finer side to finish and this generally takes uh, putting the key on and off the horn repeatedly and this is the most difficult section of the oboe to get apart and back together. That's why I'll go to the trouble to take all these keys off and just focus on one pad at a time. And then you try it with the penciled paper again. And I'm just pulling it about an eighth of an inch or so. If I pull it all the way across then it is going to likely mark the other side because uh, even if it's leaking uh, as it comes out because the paper has a little bit of thickness to it too and you would do that several times if you get the pad fit to the key so that's uh, not bad it seems to be a little heavier on the sides than it does at the front and the back maybe the tone holes slightly warped or the pad slightly I didn't get it as flat as I thought but that's really pretty good and I could keep going like that until the the pencil is, is even all the way around. And then when I've done that, I would take my Dremel tool with a small bit and this is how you can put apertures in, a, in any pad. And I'd go right down the center of the pad until I can hear it just touch the metal you're probably gonna scratch the metal inside the key just a tiny bit and that opened up that hole very nicely took out the glue and everything and that's a quite a good pad job right there almost but not quite perfect
This is the low B key on the same instrument. I'm going to show you putting a, uh, this is a leather, uh, a white kid bassoon pad from Fox Bassoons. Uh, those seal a little bit better than skin pads, but the, the technique would be the same with a skin pad. So I'm going to use my familiar torch to get some of this hot glue melted. People have kind of gone away from the shellac. Uh, a lot of your sax uh, repairmen still use it. Uh, I would see uh, pads falling out of clarinets and saxophones all the time during marching season. Uh, the shellac gets kind of brittle in cold weather. Now that pad fit better and it, it swelled up a little bit from the heat and, and isn't fitting so well now.